Heavenly Father, thank you for your light, which gives meaning and fellowship to the St. James congregation. Thank you for our caring and involved staff, especially Ray and Jacques, who reach out to us each week with a new message to help us grow in our faith. Thank you that we can look forward to our eternal life in heaven that you have promised to all believers in the name of Christ. We are so blessed that we live in a time and space where we can try to spread the good news about you without fear of persecution or prejudice. Help us to be proactive in taking your message to those who do not know or choose to disbelieve. Let us act as lanterns in our lifestyle so that those looking at us will want to share in your light and your strength. All good things come from you, O oh God. Our joy is from you, and you have given us confidence that our sins have all been forgiven. I want now to read a prayer whose author is unknown to me. Lord, bless the folk who somehow never got there, the people who intended something fine. The, mo the folk who might have lived a little nobler, the men who somehow always failed to shine, the people who have tried to keep their temper and yet who seem to lose it all the more, the ones who haven't made their name at business, who should be rich, yet always will be poor, the folk who aren't as clever as they should be, who aren't as good, and feel their efforts vain. Lord, bless all these, and Lord, bless me among them, and give us all the heart to try again. Amen. Good morning. Our reading today is from 1 John 1, verse 1 to 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning and welcome to St. James this morning. My name is Jacques. I'm part of the pastoral team here at St. James. And... Um, as Etienne has mentioned, we are continuing our series in this uh, tremendous epistle, this tremendous letter that John wrote. 1 John, there's three that he wrote, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Um, but before that, he actually wrote the Gospel of John, and after that, he wrote the book of Revelation. And it's tremendous how pastoral and evangelistic John is in his writing. In the Gospel of John, he wrote, so the people would believe in Jesus Christ, and by believing, have eternal life. In the letters, he wrote that those who have believed in Jesus Christ, that they will be sure, that they will have assurance that they have eternal life. In Revelation, those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, that they will have hope. Tremendous hope. So this morning we're continuing with this series in 1 John on this theme of assurance. A theme that I think is of absolute importance to us. Um, those who have trusted in Christ, those who are maybe still wondering whether they are in the faith or not. I think this is a tremendous theme for us to consider together. Let me begin by mentioning just two words to you. Joy and fellowship. One of them is actively pursued. The other one is passively 
receive. <clears throat> so many will say, you pursue joy. You pursue happiness. And when you find joy, they would say that you have found fulfillment. Interestingly enough, one experienced counselor said that the more desperate we become about finding joy or happiness, the more likely we are to experience symptoms of depression. Because we will begin to blame ourselves for being unhappy. We will begin to blame ourselves for being unhappy. See, pursuing happiness, whether in your own life or in the life of another, it seems like a worthy cause. And we will nod our heads and say, yes, of course, we should all want happiness. We should all want joy. In our culture, happiness is one of, if not the highest goals in life. We pursue it at all costs, through relationships, through, through wealth, through fame, through success. We make sacrifices to achieve it. We give up our time and our money in, in its pursuit. And when happiness fades, we start questioning our involvement in things that don't make us happy. So we consider moving on when relationships get hard. Our jobs are not, uh, no longer rewarding. Uh, we ask ourselves questions like, well, how can I be happy when I hate my job? <laughs> Or how can I be happy when parenthood isn't what I expected? Or how can I be happy when my marriage is hard? Or how can I be happy when being elderly is such a lonely road? Experiencing joy is not a bad thing. But it's not the ultimate thing. Despite what our culture would have us believe. It is not even our highest aim in life. You've heard this quote before by C.S. Lewis. I think Ray might have mentioned it before. I'm not sure, but I know that I've heard it before. But let me read it to you again. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. See, the happiness we labor so hard to achieve, it pales in comparison to the deep and profound joy found in God. This is where the problem with this pursuit of happiness lies. When we look for it, apart from God, we seek a false substitute. One that's temporary, one that's fleeting. It wears off once we return home from our vacation. It wears off when our marriage reaches a difficult season. Or our job isn't as fulfilling as it once was. Yet many of us would continue to pursue joy and happiness. On well, this morning's text, 1 John 1, 1-4 that Dennis, Dennis read for us, it gives us two purpose statements. Look at those verses. The purpose statements are um, preceded by this clause, so that... Towards the end of verse 3, so that you may have fellowship with us. End of verse 4, so that our joy may be complete. One of them you can actively pursue. The other you passively receive. The one you actively pursue is not joy, but fellowship. Fellowship. Which is what we will consider this morning. The pursuit of fellowship, if you will. So please bow with me and let's ask the Lord's help as we consider these few verses to give this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning. 
And Jesus, in you we gather as your Spirit unites us. Holy Spirit of God, we commit ourselves to you this morning and humbly ask that you encourage those here who believe in Jesus but struggle with doubt and assurance. We also pray that you will bring genuine heart conviction to those who know they are not in a right relationship with you. I pray that you will lead us as we consider this text this morning. May the fruit that you desire from this passage become evident in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. So we passively receive joy as we actively pursue fellowship. Look with me at verse 4. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. The word our in this text is not only a reference to John and the disciples or the apostles who were with Jesus when Jesus was on earth. It includes them, yes. But it also includes anyone who would adhere to the things written. Who would believe in and follow the things written. So in this passage, John repeatedly refers to we, which includes the apostles and himself, those who were with Jesus, those who were present with Jesus when he was on earth, who heard him, who saw him, who looked upon him and who touched him. But as he writes, he also includes those that he is writing to. So verse 2 and verse 3, that we have what we have heard and seen, we have proclaimed to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. So he's writing these things so that our, his, the disciples who were with Jesus, the recipients of the letter, and all who would adhere to what was written, what is written, so that our, collectively, our joy may be complete. Now the joy spoken of here refers to an internal, below the surface, settled joy. And it's complete. Or as some translations may put it, <clears throat> it is full. A fullness that cannot be stopped. Um, it is below the surface and it's full. And John is saying here that there is a joy that no matter the conditions, no matter the context, no matter the situations, this joy is settled. It is full. It cannot be stopped. It is always there. It is a constant undercurrent. Amid the suffering, amid the hardship, there is joy. Not a smile on the face kind of joy. But a deep, settled assurance, a deep, settled awareness, a deep, settled joy that says, it's okay. It's going to be okay. A joy that says, it is well with my soul. No matter the situation, the conditions, the context. I try to think of how to illustrate this. And then I thought, thought of, um, I thought of boreholes <laughs> to illustrate this. Um, but bear with me. Think, think, of, think of the underground currents, the, the, the underground rivers and the underground lakes that, that never empties. It's amazing. It is always full and sustains those on the surface during various conditions. I don't, I read the other day, or actually when I was playing tennis um, yesterday, this one lady that I'm playing with, much an older lady, she's an elderly lady playing tennis and she makes me run. Anyway, she, she comes up to me and says, did you hear that they found um, a, a, a lake in, in a place, I'll tell you now, um, in South Africa? It's a desert place. And I'm like, what? How's that? Okay, let me go and Google this. And as I Google it, well, I actually found this in 1986. So my friend was a little bit late. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if they found um, a lake, and it's apparently the largest, biggest lake 
in the world, an underground lake that they found. And it's the largest and biggest lake in the world. Guess where they found it? Let me tell you the name and maybe you might <coughs> know where they found it. It's called Dragon's Breath Cave. Any nods? Anyone familiar with that? I don't know why they would call it this. Anyway, they found it in the Kalahari. The biggest underground lake in the Kalahari. It's a lake that remains full in the middle of the harshest of conditions, the Kalahari Desert, enabling the trees that are around it to remain green throughout the year, even producing fruit. Amazing. You see, this kind of under the surface, settled, complete, full joy is like the river, like this lake. But it's like the river that, that is spoken of in Jeremiah 17. Beautiful. Verse 7, Jeremiah 17. The man who trusts in the Lord is blessed. Verse 8. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green. And it's not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. So what John is saying here is that it is possible for Christians to have this kind of below the surface, internal, settled, full joy throughout their Christian lives, no matter the context, no matter the situations, no matter what we face. But here's the thing. It is not a joy that we can produce. And it's not a joy that can be, can be pursued. It is a joy that flows from a fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. It's a joy that flows from trusting the Lord. Look at verse 3. That you may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship. It's a term we unhelpfully use a little bit loosely, even here at church. I mean, you've heard me say, um, we will say things like, well, join us with tea and coffee after the service and let's continue our fellowship together. What are we actually saying by then? So let's drink a lot of tea and read, let's drink a lot of coffee and let's talk. Let's catch up. But in the first century, fellowship wasn't seen in that way at all. In Greek, it's a word koinonia. It's the idea of having things in common, sharing, a participation. It is being in partnership. In the first century, if two guys would uh, buy a boat together and they will set up a fishing business on the Lake of Galilee, that was fellowship. That was partnership. They partnering together. They had certain commitments and things in common that brought them together with stated common goals and they were therefore in fellowship, in partnership with one another. And the fellowship of the church was understood to be men and women brought together with certain things in common. Shared commitments, shared values, and a shared knowledge of God. It was this, this shared values and shared goals and the shared vision that made them into a partnership, that made them, that brought them together into a fellowship. Whose values? Whose goals? Whose vision? God's. So John is saying here that we, witnesses who first came into contact with the living God by the Word made flesh, we have fellowship with Him. And we now proclaim this message to you so that you can partner with us. And when we enter this partnership with the apostles, guess what? Along with the apostles and all those who have been part of this partnership throughout the ages, we find ourselves in fellowship with, in partnership with the Father and the Son, Jesus. We are in fellowship with the apostles, with all who are part of this partnership and with God. Together we have come to share God's values, His way of thinking, His way of looking at things, His goals. How? 
So how do we pursue this fellowship? How do we enter into this partnership? Well, it's by believing what the apostles wrote, proclaimed, testified. That is what it means to enter into a partnership with the apostles. We believe God's word, what is written. And in this passage, John writes that what they wrote, what they proclaimed and testified to was, verse 1, what they had heard, what they had seen, what they had looked upon, intently studied, and what they had touched. Who? Jesus. We've seen Him. We've studied Him. We heard Him. We touched Him. And I won't be surprised if John is referring here or have in mind Thomas. Here's my hands. Here's my side. Come, Thomas, touch. Do not doubt. Believe. We are testifying. We are proclaiming. We are writing about Him. Jesus. Now let me draw your attention to how John describes Jesus. Because what John writes here about Jesus, here in this letter, will either confirm or challenge your faith in Jesus. It will confirm or challenge your assurance of eternal life. Firstly, Jesus has no beginning. Verse 1 and verse 2, that which was from the beginning, verse 2, the eternal life which was with the Father. So the Son, Jesus Christ, is what was from the beginning and is the eternal life that was with the Father. Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, has always existed with the Father as God the Son. He does not have a beginning. He does not have an end. He has always existed. There has never been a time when the Son was not. Never. He was before. He was in and from the beginning. And that is what John believed because that is what Jesus taught. That is what he said. That's what they heard. Jesus boldly declared in John 8 verse 58, Before Abraham was, I am. And that indicates that he is the God of Exodus 3 verse 14, where God said to Moses, I am who I am. Go tell the people that I am have sent you. In John 10 verse 30, Jesus says, The Father and I are one. John 14 9, He told Philip, The one who has seen me has seen the Father. See, Jesus thought that He is God. And John taught the same. There never was a time when the Son was not, and there will never be a time when He will not be. This Jesus is God the Son. This Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. Secondly, this God became flesh. Yahweh in the flesh. Which is a tremendous stumbling block for many. God became flesh and dwelt among us for 33 years as Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Verse 2. The life was made manifest. The eternal life, which was with the Father, was made manifest to us. So John is an eyewitness of what Jesus said and did. And this is neither hearsay nor second-hand account. The Apostle presents an eyewitness account of the incarnation. God becoming flesh. God as man. John uses repetition here for emphasis. You know, when you want to hear what is on someone's heart, Listen to the words that they, that they repeat. And you'll find out what's on their hearts. And John repetitively say, We have seen, we have heard, we have touched. What? Repeatedly in verse 2, The word of life became manifest, manifest, revealed, appeared as Jesus. The biblical Jesus is no myth, no fairy tale, no fable. He is not a ghost or illusion or merely a spiritual reality. 
He is the God who took on full humanity. The Word became flesh, says John. And he says that in, in, his, in the Gospel. John 1 verse 14. Jesus Christ is fully God and He is fully man. He is not half God and half man. Or all God and no man. Or all man and no God. Nor is He simply a man uniquely um, in touch with the divine. No, He is the God-man. Like no one else who will ever live. He has always been with the Father and at Bethlehem He came to be with us. As a human. Fully human. One preacher says that this is what is a scandal for so many. Stumbling block. The Incarnation. I can't say it a better way, so I'm going to quote him here. Many are willing to believe in Christ if He remains a merely spiritual reality. But when we preach that Christ has become a particular man in a particular place, issuing particular commands, and dying on a particular cross, exposing the particular sins of our particular lives, then the preaching ceases to be acceptable for many. I don't think it is so much the mystery of a divine and human nature in one person that causes most people to stumble over the doctrine of the Incarnation. The stumbling block is that if the doctrine is true, every single person in the world must obey this one particular Jewish man. Everything he says is law. Everything he did was perfect. And the particular or the particularity of this work and word flow out into history in the form of a particular inspired book that claims all that claims a universal authority over every other book that has ever been written. This is the stumbling block of the incarnation. When God becomes a man, he strips away every pretense of man to be God. We can no longer do our own thing. We must do what this one Jewish man wants us to do. We can no longer pose as self-sufficient because this one Jewish man says we are all sick with sin and must come to him for healing. We can no longer depend on our own wisdom to find life because this one Jewish man who lived for 33 obscure years in a little country in the Middle East, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When God becomes a man, man ceases to be the measure of all things. And this man, this one Jewish man, becomes the measure of all things. Stumbling block. Jesus, that Jewish man, who had no form or majesty like King Saul, that we should look at him. No beauty like King Solomon, that we should des desire him. He was the kind of man despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, the kind of man that you would not want to be with. But this Jewish man says, I am God. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And this man is in heaven. There's a man in heaven representing us. Standing in for us. Praying for you. John presents for anyone to consider an audible, visible, and tangible witness concerning Jesus of Nazareth. So why would these truths, Jesus' divinity and humanity, confirm or challenge your faith and your assurance of eternal life? Because of its implications. 
because of the effect it should have on your life. Because of the impact it should have on your life. You see, here's the thing. So many people today rely upon life for salvation. We hear it all the time, right? People say it does not matter what you believe, which church you belong to, or if you even go to church, what religion you are part of, etc. It does not matter. All that matters is how you live. All that matters is how you live. All that matters is whether you are a decent, morally upright and good natured person. How you live. I've got a friend. He's an ICU at the moment. A good natured man. Kind. Always encouraging. Play tennis with him. Always sees the positive. But he doesn't know Jesus. And a bike, motorbike accident caused him to lie now, strapped down, broken neck, seven ribs, lung punctured. Good natured guy. Now people think, and other religions say, that your life saves you. How you live, it saves you. You just need to live right. Now, if you follow that way of thinking, then you must conclude that you will never be sure. You will never have assurance of salvation until the day that your life is done. Christianity is the only religion that says somebody else's life saves you. The life of Jesus Christ saves you. Look at how John describes him again. End of verse 1, the word of life. Verse 2, the life, the eternal life. So if you want to know what John means by what he is writing you, just flip back to the gospel, the first chapter in the gospel. And, and he says this, John chapter 1, verse one, two, two, uh, one, verse 1 and 2, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So Jesus had no beginning. He was with God. He is God. Verse 3. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. So when God created, Jesus spoke creation into being. Jesus is the word of life. He is the word who gave life. But He does not only give life. He is the source of life. He is life. John chapter 1 verse 4. In Him was life. Not only does He speak life into being, He is life. And not only is He life, but eternal life is found in and through Him. Later on in John's Gospel, John chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. Verse 16 is, we know it. Verse 15. Whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Look at 1 John 1, 1 to 4 again. The joy spoken of in verse 4. It comes through a partnership with the apostles and with the father and the son. I read the apostles' testimony. I read their proclamations, their writings about Jesus. Who is God incarnate? I read about that. The word of life. He is God incarnate. The word of life. The giver of life. The source of life. And the eternal life. And I believe what I am reading. And I enter into this partnership. And I find myself, as I believe what I'm reading and entering into this partnership, that I'm entering into a partnership with the Father and the Son because I'm believing in Jesus Christ, whom John writes about. It's a question that we need to ask ourselves. Am I in fellowship? Am I in partnership with the Father and the Son? 
Well, let me put it to you this way. Let me ask it maybe in this way. Put some handles on it. Can you describe for me? Can you describe for me? Give me examples. Illustrate or articulate that God is teaching you things. Can you show me how he is restraining you from things? How he is counseling, how he is encouraging, how he is supporting, how he is challenging, how he is changing you. Pressing on particular themes in your life that he wants to work on in you. What is he teaching you? What is he showing you? Can you articulate things like that? Is he helping you to be concerned about his values, his goals, his desires? Is he revealing to you more and more what he is like and wants you to be like? Are you seeing that? As you pray, do you sense that He is hearing you? Are you in fellowship with Him? Is your relationship with God flat? A one-dimensional religion where you subscribe to it, to its rules and to its regulations and to its traditions? Or... Is it a fellowship, a partnership where there is a personal dealing with God? You have to consider these questions. Let's pray. Father, we bow our heads before you. And we do so in Jesus. As your spirit enables us. Thank you that we can bow before you. And approach you. The one in whom we trust. The one in whom we have our being. Lord Jesus, thank you that you made that possible for us. You, the word of life, life, eternal life. And the Holy Spirit, thank you that you brought about faith, conviction. Thank you. Lord, we want to continue following you, trusting you. And may that deep, settled joy be more and more evident as we go through life. May it testify of faith in Christ. So help us, Lord. Where at times we struggle, where at times we doubt, bring the assurance we need. Or help us, Lord, we may think we are right, but we know we are not. Bring conviction. Help us realize our need of Jesus. In whom alone salvation is found. Help us, Lord, we pray.